Many years ago, I'm told that there were a group of firefighters that were sent into a forest that was on fire, and they were trying to put out this forest fire, but it just got out of hand, and before long, their eyes were filled with smoke, and they could hardly see, and they were breathing in the smoke, and they, 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 they were certain that, the, that death was uh, imminent, and as they prepared for their um, final day on earth, their finer, final few hours on earth, a helicopter came overhead and it dropped a rope down with a weight on it and on that rope was attached a message. And when they opened up the message, they discovered that it was a map that drew for them a a bit of a trail. If they followed this trail through the woods, they'd be able to escape to freedom. Obviously the helicopter couldn't land in the midst of the smoke, so they dropped this message down. The firefighters didn't know where they were, but they trusted in the map and they were able to eventually find their way out of the fire. Now, I share that with you as an analogy for what many of our lives are in fact like. Uh, Maybe you feel today that you're kind of trapped and you might be trapped um, in a situation where you feel you have no way out. Maybe you feel relationally isolated. Many of us do at different points in our lives or We may be struggling with a physical illness and we just can't seem to get over it. Or we feel like we are being spiritually attacked and on and on and on. We could probably set aside a few hours today to hear testimonies from God's people about the forest fires of life that we have experienced perhaps even this week. And when we experience these kind of challenges in our lives, there's usually sort of a a list of go-to responses that we typically have. So depending on your personality and your background, some of us respond to the challenges of life with activity. Like, well, if I just get more active, I just do more, maybe I'll forget about the challenges that I'm experiencing. Uh, Other people get angry uh, with God or with other human beings around them that are maybe contributing to their problems. Other people become very accusatory. They accuse God. They accuse the world. They accuse the government. They accuse the church of being the source of their problem. Or others will just get depressed and feel like giving up, even to the point that some people take their own lives because life just feels so, so, so overwhelming. But what we're going to learn about God today or perhaps better said for most of you, be reminded of, is that while God enters into our pain, and while God lives among us, and while God comes alongside us as a father and friend, God is also above us. God transcends the smoke of life. God sees things from a different vantage point than we do. And so when we're down here and we feel like we can't find our way out, can't find a path to freedom, when we receive from the Lord this little message that he's given to us and we follow its instructions, step by step, day by day, the Lord leads us to greener pastures, to places of safety and freedom. Now, it's true that God's word doesn't tell us necessarily how long that path's going to be. Your journey through the smoky forest might take you several more years. Or God might bring you out of it sooner than that. God doesn't always detail out to us the specifics of our circumstances. But when we choose to trust in him and patiently wait upon him, God brings us through. So here's the call that I believe we are receiving from Revelation 14 today, and it is this, stand firm, endure, persevere, and be patient. Stand firm, don't give up, don't give in, don't grow weary, keep moving forward, get into God's word, ask God to reveal to you how to respond to the challenges of your specific circumstances. Trust in him. Be patient. And when you do, the God who hovers above but also dwells with will lead us to freedom. 
So this then raises the question, how? How is that kind of patience expressed? How is that kind of perseverance expressed? What does it look like to be a person who endures? Well, we're going to find out today. And as I mentioned to you moments ago, Revelation 14 gives us this little picture of how God's people did respond or will respond during the particular threats that were challenging them. And the first truth we're going to see in these first 13 verses of Revelation 14 is that one of the marks of a believer that wants to persevere and continue is this. We need to keep worshiping God. Keep worshiping God. Because when we are in trial, in tribulation, the human tendency is to start to think, well, clearly God has forgotten about me. Clearly God doesn't care for this little guy down here. Maybe God doesn't exist. And our worship can start to diminish. And when we take our eyes off of him, what do we have left? All of this. And because all of this is part of the brokenness that we experience, it actually gets worse. But by fixing our eyes on the Lord Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we are able to push forward. And so in times of great trial, as we fix our attention on the Lord, we are blessed. Let me just give you a couple words with regard to the context, especially for those of you that might just be joining in. In Revelation, in the recent chapters, chapters 12 and 13, we were told that in the future, Satan, who's described as the great red dragon, will attack the people of God with full force. Being somewhat unsuccessful and conquered by the angels of heaven, he then calls to his aid a beast from the sea and a beast from the land, which represent either a despotic ruler in the future or maybe a world system that wants to take down God's people. And they attack God's people. And then we have an antichrist-like figure that also rises up to attack God's people. And this is part of the message of chapters 12 and 13, and it's picked up again in the next chapter. But chapter 14, especially the first part, is kind of like a pause in this narrative of evil. And in this pause, we have kind of a worship set. We actually get to listen in on a worship service. It's kind of like maybe you had a really rough morning today. You know, your car broke down or your spouse got mad at you or your kids misbehaved or you woke up sick. And maybe you'll have some more of that tonight, but right now you have a bit of a pause to worship God and turn your eyes upwards. And this is what we see in chapter 14 where in the middle of all this turmoil, in the middle of the fire that's burning around the people of God, God just kind of takes our attention upward. And we capture this vision of worship taking place in the presence of God. So pick it up with me at verse 1. We'll just study the first five verses to get ourselves going here. Revelation 14. So this is the Apostle John. And he says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion, that is a name for the eternal throne room of God here in this context, Jerusalem, stood the lamb who's Jesus and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. So if you go back to Revelation chapter seven, we already learned that the 144,000 is probably a symbolic number, 12,000 individuals from all of the 12 tribes of Israel probably not a literal number, but a perfect number of Jewish people turn to Christ and receive him as their Messiah during the tribulation, which is totally fascinating because en masse, most Jewish people still reject Jesus as the Messiah in the here and now. 
But in the future, God will pour out so much attention on the Jews by his grace and mercy, they will turn to him. And so we have here a picture of Jews that have been martyred, believers that have been martyred for Jesus, that are now in the throne room of God, and they are worshiping God. And it says of them, and I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. I heard, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing in their harps. I was like, well, what was the sound? We know it's loud. We know it's exuberant. We know it's passionate. But what was the sound? Here's the sound. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. In the scriptures, this little term, new song, often comes up. And normally it refers to some fresh encounter that someone is having with God. So we have a picture of these believers whose lives have been taken for the cause of Christ in the eternal kingdom, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And around them and with them are the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Earlier in the book of Revelation, we learned that these are celestial heavenly beings that perpetually and eternally exist for the express purpose of worshiping God. Now, these beings are incapable of doing something that all of us do and have done. You know what it is? They never yawn. They never grow bored. God's presence fascinates them so much that for all of eternity, they're worshiping God and they're never like, oh, this is getting really dry. Could we take a coffee break? Now, I've been to a lot of boring church services over the years and it's crossed my mind, do I really want to do this for all of eternity? But in the presence of God, the full presence of God in the eternal kingdom, we will never yawn, we'll never, bore, we'll never be bored It won't be forced. It will be a natural outflow of the encounter that we have with the eternal God who perpetually and eternally and sufficiently satisfies us in ways that we can't even frankly imagine right now. We can try to put words to it, but we're not there yet. But in the eternal kingdom, that encounter will satisfy. These 24 and 4 are worshiping God and they're never like, oh, And the believers are joining with with them in the worship of God. And meanwhile, below them, the fires are burning and the beasts are working and the Antichrist is moving. But in the throne room of God, there is worship. It says, no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth, which probably means that this was an expression of worship that was unique to them because of what they'd gone through. And it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins, which probably doesn't mean that they were uniquely virgin males, but it's probably symbolic language that puts them in contrast to unbelievers who have committed spiritual adultery from God by worshiping other gods, including the Antichrist and the beast and Satan himself. So this language here is likely language that is meant to symbolize their purity before God. It is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These who have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb And in their mouth, no lie was found, for they were blameless. Perfect and righteous before God in the throne room, worshiping God without end, totally satisfied. I would say that is totally awesome. And something we should all look forward to. So here's what we see here, I think. We're seeing a picture in the middle of turmoil of the possibility of being satisfied with God in his presence 
engaged in perpetual worship, even while the end has not yet fully come. Why are we told this? Is it to make us jealous? Or is it to make us thirsty? Is it to say, well, how come they get that? And I don't get that. I don't think so. I think it's there to make us thirsty for that and to seek to practice some of that during the challenges that we experience in the here and now. You see, God is changeless. That doesn't mean that God is callous toward your pain, but he is changeless. No matter what's going on beside him or below him, God never gets like confused. I get confused. I'm like, why is this happening? I can't figure this out. Sometimes I feel like I'm starting to lose my mind. Like, why can't this just go away? God never gets confused. God never changes. God sees through the smoke. God continues to welcome people into heaven. Heavenly beings continue to worship him. The martyred saints continue to worship him. Even with all the confusion going on in the world. That's reason for hope, church. We, we do know two things about God. And they can seem at first listen to be contradictory. But they're not. God simultaneously is with us. His spirit indwells us. His precious inspired word is before us. God is with his people. One of the names of Jesus is Emmanuel, the God who is with us. So he is with us. He's in this place today. But God is also above and beyond. Now, many, many years ago, especially some of the early founders of the United States, and maybe there were some in Canada too, concluded that because there's evil in the world, but there's also a creation. God must exist, but he mustn't be present. And the name for people like that were deists. Deists. They believed that God started the world, created the world, wound up the world, and left. But a theist, which is where we're at, it's where I'm at at least, I hope you are too, is one that believes God created the world, started the world, but also lives with us in this world and manifests his presence to us. And that God, who is both beyond our circumstances, but also in them, again, he he never gets crazy when the smoke starts to get thick. We see this demonstrated in Jesus on the cross. Jesus never... He never freaks out. He never freaks out. He stays on course. He perseveres. He patiently obeys the will of the Father. His mind doesn't fog up with depressing depressing thoughts when his church is moaning with pain. God takes us through the fire, but he's also unscathed by it. Are you prepared to stake your life on the promises and the person of our changeless God. Even in the middle of trial, to continue to worship him. You see, by worshiping him continually, even in our pain, and exercising patient trust in him, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we're able to stay the course We're able to persevere by looking up. So just think of it this way. We often talk in our church about the vertical and the horizontal axes. The problem with living in a broken world is that everything in the horizontal realm is either destroyed or damaged or in some way diseased by sin and its consequences. So therefore, even the best of life cannot provide us 
with true satisfaction or the answers to our problems. And we can't really trust him. You know what? You can't really even trust me because I'm still a sinful man. We can't really fully trust one another because we let each other down. We can't trust world systems. We can't trust in, Bible talks about horses and chariots. How about governments, political systems, educational institutions, family structures? We can't fully trust in those things because they're all marred, broken, or diseased by sin. But God is not. And God is constantly calling us, look up out of the mess, look up out of the mess, fix your eyes on me. Let me lead you to greener pastures. So if we're having a problem down here, yeah, the cause on a certain level is one another or the systems of life. But if we can't find a way out of it, really our problem is a worship problem. It's a worship problem. But when we start to worship again, even though this stuff around here is still broken, so many of our problems, the perspective is put on it. We find hope. We find healing. doesn't mean things necessarily change around us, but things certainly change within us. So keep worshiping God. It's a mark of a persevering believer. Secondly, we need to keep revering God, or as the text calls it, fearing God. We need to continue to fear God. Now, this word fear is an interesting word. Because normally when we think of fear, we think that's a negative word. I don't like that word. And it's true because most fear is a word that brings about some sort of disability. Like, I I can't think. I can't function. I can't trust. I can't love because of the fears of this life, the fear of mankind, the fear of my own inadequacies, the fear of satanic attack. But fear of God, this might help you, is not a disabling fear, it's an enabling fear. Fear of God enables us to be the people that God has designed us to be, to acknowledge, hey, I'm not creator, I'm creature. I want to Honor you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You are above me. You are beyond me. The fear of the Lord, the Bible says, is the beginning of wisdom, about life skill. Now, for the unbeliever, the fear of God means terror of his judgment because God will damn you if you live your entire life and never surrender yourself to his lordship because he's just. And justice demands a righteous verdict. But for the believer who has surrendered themselves to Jesus, the Bible says we're no longer condemned. We might still be convicted a lot, but we're no longer condemned. And in that state, terror is transformed into reverent awe, which leads to worship. So then we live our lives this way. We say... No matter how awful life is, God is still awesome. And I can live my life with that hopeful reality in mind. John writes in verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead. So he's, he's observing this worship thing going on. He says, I see another angel flying overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. So we have this vision of God's, it's really, I I would say, a vision that expresses God's heart for humanity. The same heart that was demonstrated when Jesus showed up in a manger, the same heart that was demonstrated when Jesus rolled the stone away, the same heart that was demonstrated when Jesus said, hey guys, you know, those of you that are following me, I want you to go into the world and share the gospel everywhere to all the nations. That same heart is still being expressed in the eschatological future as this angel delivers out to all nations, tribes, languages, and peoples, really a call to surrender to Jesus and to participate in eternal worship. Verse seven, and he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory. 
because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who has made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. Now, what, what were these words called in the previous verse? Do you remember? They were called the eternal gospel. So that means we now have a definition of what the gospel is throughout time. The gospel under the old covenant might be expressed slightly differently than the gospel under the new covenant because under the new covenant, you now have Jesus, you have a resurrection, you have a crucified Savior on a cross. But the eternal gospel, the essence of the gospel at the end of the day under either covenant or even beyond that covenant into the tribulation period, is essentially at its heart a call for humanity to fear God and give him glory. That is why in our church we often say that the mission of God is the glory of God. Maybe you, you weren't taught that. Maybe you thought, oh, the mission of God was to make me happy. The mission of God was to fix my problems. The mission of God was to give me fire insurance. So I don't have to go to hell for all of eternity. Well, those are benefits for someone who has received the eternal message. But the essence of the eternal gospel is essentially a stark reminder. You are a creature and he is a creator and you need to surrender to him. And when you surrender to him, you give him glory because the mission of God is to bring glory to himself. So read it again. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. In other words, hey guys, just in case you forgot, I am the creator. Now I got to do something I've already done this morning. I got to share an illustration twice which I'd rather not even share once because it's embarrassing and it's shameful. It happened 40 years ago when I was six years old and I'm still embarrassed by it. But I share it with you by way of illustration because I think that while your experience might be different, your problem is the same as mine. I remember being six years old the summer of 1979, and standing on my front lawn in St. Thomas, Ontario. And I don't know what I was doing before that. But I remember to stand there and looking at a tree that had these orange berries on it. And I thought to myself, where did all this come from? Where did all this come from? And you know what thought crossed my mind? I thought to myself, I, I bet you that none of this is actually real that I'm the only one who is real. And all of this exists to make me happy. Can you imagine that? I'm a six-year-old punk. And I was already learning to play the role of God. That the world revolves around me. The reason why you're here, you're not, you're not as real as me. You exist as an audience to clap and make my life better. Now, you may not have had as ridiculous and shameful thoughts as I had, but you know what? That is at the heart of your problem too. You may not have been as evil in the way you expressed it as I was, but all of us live our lives with this kind of innate, natural sense that the world revolves around me. And it is expressed from our earliest days when we make demands of our mothers and steal toys from our friends and balk when we get pushed aside and are depressed when we don't get the promotion and brag when we do and on and on and on and on. The human problem is a worship problem. The problem is I want to be worshiped. And I don't want to worship God. 
And of course, through the blessing of salvation, I was saved that fall in October of 79. The Lord changed my mindset. And I now have a greater understanding of why I actually exist, but I still fight. I still fight the residual sin nature in me that says, ah, it's about you, Aaron. It's about you. Passages like this are intended to correct that sinful thought. God is so great. He's so glorious. He's so distinct. You know, the Old Testament prophets described God as one that if you actually encountered him in all of his fullness, the light of his presence would be so bright that you'd basically be vaporized. You ever welded? When I was very young, my grandfather used to weld in his shop, and he would always say to me, if I was anywhere near, don't look, Aaron, don't look. And I, I'm like, okay, I'm not looking, Grandpa. Because the, the light coming off of an arc weld is so intense, it can actually damage your eyes. So you have to wear the proper mask and proper clothing. I've been sunburned many times welding. It's very dangerous. Maybe one of the brightest lights on earth. But that light, compared to God, is like a firefly. God is so pure and so righteous and so true that to see him in all of his glory, it's like we just get vaporized. So this is why, if you read Ecclesiastes chapter 5, for example, the Bible says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Offer not the sacrifice of a fool. Be careful with your mouth. Because God is to be feared. God is to be be approached reverently. William Gurnall once said, this is a man that lived a long, long time ago. A fellow brother that walked in the same world that we live. He said, we fear men so much because we fear God so little. That is just like so true. It'll always be true until Jesus returns and takes us home. You ever have like fear of people? You're like, oh man, I hope people like me. You know, why, why did she get the compliment and I didn't? Why did he get the compliment and I didn't? How come no one shook my hand? No one noticed me? We're so self-absorbed and we can live our lives. We, we, we become performers. I want to perform for you. I want you to like me. I want you to provide for me. I want you to compliment me. All of these things flow out of a fear of man. And if man provides what we think we, we deserve, we grow prideful. If man doesn't provide what we think we need, we grow depressed or feel alienated. But it's the same problem causing those things, fear of man. And here we learn that fear of God and fear of man don't occupy the same place. Verse 8, and another angel, a second, followed him saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So into this call to fear God, another angel delivers a message. Now Babylon, as you probably know, was an ancient Mesopotamian kingdom that was kind of like the superpower of the day about 800 years up to about 600 years or so before Jesus. And this was the kingdom that captured Daniel, for example, took him into captivity. And they were, they, they later fell apart, but they are sort of like the, like the, the eternal biblical stereotype, if you will, of how not to live your life. They're like equivalent to Sodom and Gomorrah, which is like never positively stated. So Babylon represents evil, that which is in opposition to God. And we learn that in the future that the angel will finally declare the message as the eternal gospel is proclaimed. They have been wiped out. Everything they stood for, you like wine? Well, they're feeding a lot of wine, but the, the wine is sexual impurity, debauchery, godlessness. A lot of people drank of the goblet. And now God has destroyed them. 
So here we have words of hope. And I think we're told this because on the heels of our conversation about fear of God, because fear of God apparently positioned the people of God in the tribulation to worship God even in the middle of their suffering because they hear about the ultimate demise of their adversaries. So this is all basically a call for me to evaluate whether life revolves around me or life revolves around God and to put my eternal focus on God and to take my eternal focus off of me. Let me just give you this illustration. If you're a king, you're like a stereotypical king. I'm sure you have some positives, but most kings essentially exist for their own purposes. To guard their castles, to guard their wealth, to guard the inheritance of their children, to guard their name, to guard their power. It's kind of like a selfish occupation. Now, if you were to contrast that to, let's say, a bodyguard, like a bodyguard is is about as selfless of an occupation as you could ever ask for. Like, what's my job? To get killed for other people. To, to, you know, jump in the way and take the bullet. To sacrifice myself for the good of another. By nature, we like to be kings. Isn't it interesting that even when we talk to little kids, we're like, oh, you're a little prince, you're a little princess. You're a little prince, you're a little princess. And we think it's cute, and maybe it is cute, not opposed to princess parties. But in some way, what we're actually doing from the time they're very young is we're like imprinting, imprinting. You're, you're going to grow up to be a king. You're going to grow up to be a queen. You're going to rule people. No one's like, we're having a little bodyguard party. Who wants to lay down their lives for their friends? But God is calling us to essentially adopt the bodyguard mindset. I'm going to lay down my life for Jesus. I'm going to guard his reputation. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to take a bullet for him. I'm willing to be martyred for him. So what's your mindset? Are you a king? Or are you a bodyguard? And then third, we have a call to keep avoiding idolatry, which is an ongoing transcultural, transhistorical problem. Verse nine, and another angel, a third, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, we met him earlier, and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, again, probably not literal, but the idea that he wants to own you. And if you let him own you, then read the next words. He will also drink the wine. Oh, which wine is it? Is it the wine of sexual immorality, which Babylon offered? No, it's a very different kind of wine. It's the wine of God's wrath, which by the way, the Old Testament prophets spoke of. A cup of wine often represented God's fury, foaming wine especially, poured out on the godless. Poured full strength into the cup of his anger and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, which reminds us that Eternal damnation is eternal and conscious. We don't believe in annihilationism as some would prefer to teach. And I would, I would also prefer that if it was possible. But the Bible seems to indicate that eternal damnation is in fact eternal. They will have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. So it's like, Lord, why are you telling me this? What do you want me to do about this? How do you want me to respond to this? This is how I want you to respond. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus, which by the way, are both manifestations of true faith. All sufficient faith in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to save you, followed up with spiritual fruit, good deeds, a life that is conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. As evangelicals, we fought a lot of fights 500 years ago, so we love to talk about salvation by grace through faith alone, salvation by grace through faith alone, and indeed that is a true doctrine. 
that you are justified by grace through faith alone. You don't bring anything to the equation. You don't merit it. You don't pay for it. You don't contribute to it. No, it's free. It's an unmerited gift. But having received it and been transformed by it, you will live differently. You will start to look a little more, sound a little more, talk a little more like Jesus. And that will be some evidence some proof, if you will, that you really, really were arrested by grace and transformed by God's grace. True believers will persevere, and perseverance proves authenticity. So don't neglect to pay attention to your way of life, even to the point of death. Verse 13 reads, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. That's interesting. He's looking at these believers who died for the Lord. And clearly he wants us to find some application in that because having seen them worshiping God, already having died for the Lord, he's like, and by the way, for the rest of you, you will also be blessed if you die for the Lord. Blessed indeed, says the spirit, that they may find rest from their labors for their deeds will follow them. So rest awaits us. And while we cannot rest a lot while we wait, we wait because we know one day we will rest. So fix your eyes on Jesus in worship and in fear, in reverence. Assess your life for marks of faithfulness so as not to disqualify your profession. These are words of hope. Again, written about events in the future, but a huge blessing to us in the here and now. So I trust that you will be encouraged by these words and that you will continue to persevere for the Lord Jesus Christ until he calls you home. 